All right, Hebrews 8 through 13 tonight. Uh, let's recap where we were last week. We talked about the letter to the Hebrews being in two parts. Hebrews 1 through 7 we covered last week. And Hebrews 8 through 13 we're covering tonight. We said that the overarching message was Jesus' new covenant. We said that in chapters 1 through 7, uh, it mainly talked about who Jesus is. And in chapters 8 through 13, it talks about what Jesus does. And what Jesus does is to mediate a new and better covenant based on better promises. We also talked about how in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1, that this is kind of the driving verse of the letter where it says, here is the main point, and it begins to give us the main point of the letter. And that main point really comprises chapters 8 through the first half of chapter 10. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But here's what it says in the beginning of Hebrews 8. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. So Jesus' system is the true system, which Moses' system was only a type or a, or a foreshadowing of. Okay, now as we get into Hebrews 8 through 13, and we want to see what is it that Jesus does, here is what Jesus does. Um, what is the new covenant is the question we're asking, and that question is answered in verses 10 through 12 of Hebrews chapter 8 which is a quote from Jeremiah. And here's what it says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. What is the new covenant? The new covenant is he will write his laws in your mind and on your hearts. In other words, you don't need the old law anymore because the law is embedded within you. The Holy Spirit is in you to convict you when you're wrong, to let you know what the right path is, to guide you. He is writing his laws on your mind and on your heart. That is the new covenant. It's, it's, a, it's a totally new and freeing system that we have in Jesus. Okay, now we want to talk about what Jesus does. We said that what Jesus does is really what chapters 8, 9, and the first half of chapter 10 are all about. And so let's look a little bit at some of the things that Jesus does. First of all, he mediates a better covenant based on better promises. We said that, and it specifically lays that out in chapter 8, verse 6. Uh, secondly, he cl cleanses our consciences by his blood. He's not only able to purify us in a ritualistic sense, um, but he is able to cleanse, to deep clean, way down to the level of our conscience. Uh, thirdly, he secures our in eternal inheritance through his death. We talked about how he's able to deliver us into the promised rest, into the inheritance, uh, in eternal inheritance. So he's a better deliverer than Moses. So he's able to deliver us into that eternal inheritance. And then he takes away our sin by his self-sacrifice. And then it says he perfects us, accomplishing in us everything we need. Chapter 10, verse 14. And then finally, he's coming back. This thing is not over. He's coming back. And when he comes back, he will finalize and solidify the salvation uh, that we have and that we have a hope in. Our salvation is a, a, a once and for all. It has been done. It is also ongoing as a process. And it is a, uh, uh, there is a final finalization of it. In other words, we call that glorification. Uh, sometimes we talk about that as salvation, sanctification, and glorification. The three stages, the past, present, and future, uh, all are wrapped up together in a great mystery. But that is what our salvation is, is about. It, it's, it's, it's past, present, and future. Okay. So that's what Jesus does. And then, um, 
at the end of that writing, in chapters 8, 9, and 10, in the middle of chapter 10, it gives us a little bit of a therefore. Okay, here's what Jesus does. And this is a really important part of the letter to the Hebrews. Therefore, what should we do about it? And here's what he says in verse 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. And he continues, verse 22, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Uh, we talked about last week the, the priesthood and how only the high priest could go behind the veil and, and go enter the most holy place. And we talked about how Jesus' sacrifice uh, opens, rips the veil in half and, and opens up that most holy place where we can, we can go into that place. And, and so the author is saying, therefore, let's do that. We have access to the very presence of God, the most holy place. Let's boldly go into that place uh, because we have the access. Let's take advantage of it. And that is our, our uh, great um, privilege as believers to go into that most holy place. Uh, and that, that's there at the end of that section in the middle of chapter 10. Okay. Another um, piece to this puzzle now, it, beginning at the end of chapter 10, uh, there's a warning, and uh, we talked about last week three warning sandwiches in chapters one through seven. Well, now we get uh, an inverted warning sandwich, okay, where it's not a sandwich in the middle of two pieces of bread. In other words, this, the warning is not the uh, wa uh, warning in the middle of two pieces of bread. The warning is not the meat. The warning is now the bread, okay? So we have in the end of chapter 10, and the beginning of chapter 12, two warnings. And in between is chapter 11. Now, why am I bringing this out? Because chapter 11 of Hebrews is one of the most popular chapters in the Bible. It's a chapter that many believers would recognize and, and know. Yes, I've heard that before. Uh, it's what we call the Hall of Faith. Okay, kind of the Hall of Fame of faith people. Uh, important men and women throughout the Old Testament. And uh, we, we have that hall of faith, but what I want you to see is how that hall of faith, that chapter 11, connects to what comes before and what comes after, because the context of that hall of faith is important. It is in the middle of two warnings. And so I want to give you the bread of this sandwich, beginning in the end of chapter 10, beginning in verse 35 of chapter 10, it says this, so do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. And we talked about last week how this letter was written to the persecuted church. These guys have been persecuted. They've, uh, they're tried and true. Okay, And yet the author is saying, don't turn back. And so this warning at the end of chapter 10, where it says, don't turn back, uh, then goes into chapter 11, which gives the examples of those who have not turned back. Then in chapter 12, we get the other piece of bread, which is another warning in the beginning of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides, beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. So this other piece of bread, this warning in chapter 12, is the back end of the hall of faith. Okay, What I want you to see is that this hall of faith, where 
he goes in and talks about uh, Abel and Enoch and Abraham and Sarah and so forth. Um, these are designed, these examples are given of people who did not give up. Because the point of the story is don't give up. Since we have this high priest, since we have this great privilege to go enter the most holy place, since we have everything given to us that we need for salvation, don't give up. And here are these examples in chapter 11 of people who have not given up. And you need to be one of those people who do not give up. You need to continue uh, to be in this lineage of faith people, people who do not turn back, people who do not give up. And so uh, think of this hall of faith in the context of these warnings uh, that we are to not give up, but we are to be like these people of faith who did not give up. Okay. To close out now, uh, chapters 12 and 13 give the practical application of the letter. It's uh, very similar to Paul's letters, several of Paul's letters, maybe not all of them, but a few of them. In particular, I'm thinking of Romans, uh, where the book of Romans begins with 11 chapters of theology and then closes with chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 of practical Oftentimes, Paul will open a letter with, with the theology and close it with a practical application. Now, this author of the letter to Hebrews does the same thing here with 11 chapters of theology. And then uh, chapters 12 and 13, the two closing chapters, give the practical application. And I want to draw your attention to verse 14 of chapter 12, which says this, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The bottom line here in the practical application is holiness is not optional. You've heard that from me before. Uh, but without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so all of these little pieces in chapters 12 and 13 are designed to say, hey, be holy. Here's a little bit about what holiness looks like. But we want to make sure that we're doing right. We want to make sure that we're uh, following the line, this lineage of faith people, by continuing to do right, continuing to submit to the Lord, continuing to do all we can to uh, to follow him and, and to be good sons. And uh, so these two chapters uh, in the end of Hebrews give us the practical application. Here's some things about how to live daily life. And all, that all amounts to, in the end, we want to be holy. Because if we're not holy, we will have failed to do what is needed to uh, to secure that eternal inheritance. And so he empowers us to live a life of holiness, and we're supposed to do it. The message of Hebrews, Jesus' new covenant, he's done the work. It's a finished work. We step into that work, and we live our lives under his power under the power of the Holy Spirit, to live lives of holiness. In the first seven chapters, we find out a lot about who Jesus is, the high Christology. That's why I wanted to open with this letter, is to, to begin with who Jesus is. I think that's really important. And then what Jesus does for us, and then therefore, chapters 12 and 13, how are we to respond? We're to live lives of holiness. That's the message of Hebrews. See you next week. 